I s I, I'm, I'm also here to talk about what could a platform be and not uh, how it should be and uh, like in chiming in with allies actually like presenting potential building blocks uh, like things people could think about uh, uh, when planning a, a blockchain so it's not to inscribe something but to kind of rather open up at the moment the, the, the field of possibilities and um, what's coming up it's not a blockchain introduction because like I'm sort of we know it's gonna end up in a blockchain project maybe most likely but like it's actually more like platform independent and uh, I think the technology shouldn't inform the project but the project the idea should inform the the platform and um, th for, to do that I kind of broke the presentation in three parts the first is like a few very abstract things which are like sitting on the very top. And then a few aspects which we could think about, like a lot of them resonate what Ella already introduced before, like they are kind of maybe really good for you because I'm re repeating same things in different words. And then I have quite a few examples of online art platforms of different types and, and shapes, which are um, all somehow projects around creating art online. Um, to start, uh, it's simply first like the question of um, what's a platform? And there's a quote from some very rich and famous guy. I don't wanna give him more, but like it's, it's worth, like it's, it's, it's a 2011 quote, and if you wanna read it, or that's, um, it's too small maybe, no? That's a crook of shit, Facebook, which I inserted, isn't a platform. A platform is when the economic value of everybody that uses it exceeds the value of the company that creates it. Then it's a platform. So the definition, but it, is it all about economic value? And um, is an economy only about money? Because economies are exchanges between, so it doesn't need to be money. And maybe the definition for a platform as a suggestion is that a platform facilitates relationships and exchanges between users by providing suitable combination of necessary organizational and functional primitives. Those are the building blocks and they are like partly technically or infrastructure or material, but partly mental organizational uh, concepts. And uh, uh, together they're building a platform and we're after kind of designing something and or at least the first step. To do that, it's interesting to think about a few things and that's the aims of a platform and that's uh, to create or to facilitate the creation of artworks, uh, uh, to allow the curation of artworks, to kind of allow to capture the value generated and that's now neutral. It's not like extracting value to the own profit but like to kind of like make sure it sits in the platform. And um, th the last point, uh, which I'm quite interested in, is also to be able to commission artwork. So kind of like that the project is able to provide opportunities from itself and uh, not only relying on artists like, like uh, submitting their own work on own accords for their own risk, but to kind of like that a, a project could take on to a certain degree the risk of commissioning or creating new artwork. Um, there are like a few things which I find interesting to always because they kind of inform or they, they drive the success of a, of a platform and uh, one of them you might have heard it is the network effect and there is a politicized term which is network gravity which uh, um, so network e effect is um, that means the more people the more users the more participants the more valuable the platform and it's in an upward spiral and, uh, and it becomes network gravity if it's uh, because like, like it becomes harder and harder to leave the network. So if you try to move your family's, family's WhatsApp group to Signal, you know how hard it is to, uh, to leave uh, uh, the network gravity of WhatsApp. And, um, and so and also like they're kind of like very, very consciously used and approached by people like they're designing platforms to have a network effect. And um, this uh, aligns with something which they people call uh, the attention economy. Mm -hmm. It's all about your eyeballs. And the quote uh, 
of Herman, uh, Herbert Simon, um, in an information-rich world, attention becomes a scarce resource. There's too much of content, and uh, the ones who are getting attention are the winners. And this leads to something which people call the superstar economy, uh, also creator economy. It is um, no, the natural outcome if you combine a network effect on attention economy. You get something like the superstar economy. You have very few who are very successful, and the vast majority is it's, uh, I'm coming to the next slide, where this is uh, uh, better, it's like they're, they're like not even getting any attention or hardly at all. And in the arts world, it's working in the same. Um, and this is based on something where there is like some really funny, you know, it's like there's a, something they call Pareto uh, distribution or power law distribution, where you can see, which is good uh, to see on this chart, that you have like very few who are getting lots of attention, uh, um, points, money, whatever you say, it, it it kind of maps on really, really, really many of uh, systems where social interactions and network effect applies. And um, then you have the long tail, the so-called long tail of, of, of which is really flat and really, really long and there's like the vast majority is in that who are like not getting the cut. And it's like a 2080, so you see the green uh, says like 20 a, uh, percent of the, the audience, the users, the artists get 80% of the income, but then you split it up again, like again, 20% of those 20% uh, get 80%, and it goes very quickly, very high up, and if you look at the US music market, for uh, or the global music, music market, it was that 1% uh, earned in 2014, 77 percent of the whole profit revenue of the music market. So it's a very few who earn a lot and then very little. And I uh, kind of like it's the little red star is probably where uh, a middle class lifestyle starts. Like not rich, it's just, just to kind of give you an idea that even if you're orange and you have like your 20 diehard fans, uh, um, you you're kind of get a little attention but you're not making a living out of it. No? So it's really hard to kind of get into the small, small fraction of um, that earns, uh, and I'm, I'm say, saying that because I think like the, the lots of new online art markets are based on the same system. They are riding the superstar economy. Uh, I think internet uh, talks about uh, the combining with the private supply, which means that you don't look at the private attention. You say maybe the art market needs the flexibility to survive, just because you don't want the risk of being uh, unpaid. Yeah, because. Yeah, because it's like it motivates you have exactly. a so, uh, I think you you, it, it lifts uh, like those markets live of exploitation no? the exactly. vast majority tries yeah. their luck and they were never heard it's of it's and yeah yeah and um, there is like the interesting thing is like and it's like there's something called the Gini uh, coefficient that's uh, like where you can measure the unequalness in the distribution of revenue or value or like I mean it's not only about money no it's like it's just it measures the equal equality in in a market system and um, you could basically design a system that kind of looks at the Gini uh, and kind of artificially drives interest and I know there are like like some platforms which are doing this. Uh, there's a Chinese TikTok clone, uh, for example, which is doing actively. They're driving their algorithms to kind of expose people who haven't gotten. And um, but it's, we can keep on. No? Like this is like a very interesting thing, and I think it's like it's, it takes very abstract. Keep it on the very beginning, and um, then we have something which is the token economy. Uh, Ella spoke already about it. Uh, they are units of account. And that can be a changed, exchanged between uh, accounts, wallets. Um, and tokens make you whatever you can think of computational accessible. That's the interesting thing about it. You can love uh, your burgers, your robots, your work, your artwork. Uh, it's, it's simply providing a, 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 a means for computers to access whatever they represent. And that's um, the interesting thing. So like you have like these co economies because the tokens can be exchanged. The, we get into an economy, but uh, they, the, the, the most interesting thing I th is, is to think of them as that computers can handle and process them now. No? And that, uh, like say, they're placeholders for things which are usually in the, in the non-spoken realm. 
Um, so tokens are not necessarily a currency, but can be. Um, reputation, for example, is something which are could be think of, of uh, as tokens, like uh, uh, ratings, um, but you can't make a monetary value out of it. No? Like you can maybe lend your reputation, but you can't spend it. And um, token economies exist outside the blockchain. So it's not a blockchain only thing that's like the star rating at Amazon, um, uh, the badges and medals at sports events. This is all tokens um, which represent something else. And um, last to kind of bring it at least once, the non-fungible tokens is a special class of tokens uh, which can't be subdivided. That's the main thing. It's simply only one and you can't make half of it. Uh, they primarily it's in of interest for us. They make cultural expression computational accessible, and this can be a, a little loop of a, of, a, of, a, of a song, or it can be a whole artwork. Um, it can be a, a picture of a performance or a video. It's, it, it's just like it makes a fragment of cultural expression that's digitally recorded. Maybe, maybe not. It can also represent a, a physical object, but it makes this cultural expression computational accessible. Um, but they can also seen, be seen as organizational objects. You can get a token of access, for example, like uh, to something, or like a token of that you witnessed something. They, they, so like uh, kind of dealing with tokens is, is, is not necessarily a non-fungible token, means, means to be something that is for sale, but it can be issued in for other reasons. Um, and yes, they create artificial scarcity um, to which a value can be assigned to, which is like the big thing on the NFT markets. It's like the first crypto punk or, but it is not necessarily the thing that is, uh, it is interesting, I won't say that, but like it is, it's not the only thing they can do. And then, so we had like those four, uh, um, seven abstractions, um, where the, the platform implements the uh, three to four Cs, that's the aim of a platform. Um, we have like the network gravity and attention economy, which um, is the superstar economy, which is uh, best to be avoided. And uh, a token economy can uh, be more than collect and sell NFTs. So let's see where you come in with community tokens, for example, um, that's an interesting thing, which is not necessarily uh, the artwork, but it helps to kind of facilitate the creation of artworks, maybe. Um, the second part of the presentation is the assessment aspects, and they are like 19 I came up with. So Ella was smart enough to put them on one slide. I counted, they are like quite close. I had made 19 slides. And uh, so I, I kind of whisked through them and maybe skipped some, um, but it is a, it's interesting, each of them should be an entry point of what could a platform do and how could we think about it and what else could we think about. And um, the first one is um, what's the express e-source? Like uh, uh, a few quotes to kind of just get the ideas. It's, it's culture before structure. So is, is, it, is it like shaping a cultural socioeconomic system or is it about creating a app, a platform? And the other is um, the world of scarcity are made of things, world of abundances are made of dependencies. Like, are you engaging in things like this? Do you create scarcity like, like uh, l uh, loser? Um, no. Do you create win-win situations or do you create like the, the fr no, loser, yeah, what's the zero sum games? That's the word um, I've been after. Um, the second way I already spoke about is the environmental impact of a platform. If you build one, uh, it's proof uh, that the, the resource use of blockchains are kind of like questionable of certain blockchains, others are much better, like proof of work uh, stinks. Uh, uh, and uh, then there's some, some other, which I find even insane, similar insane. It doesn't have that such a big carbon footprint, but uh, there, at the moment there's a scarcity of, of SSD, big, large SSD hard drives, because there's a new blockchain around where you kind of have to put random data on your disks and prove that you kind of block that space. And therefore you're proving the blockchain by having empty, hard, like like full but empty hard disk running in your computer. That's the Chia network. So it's all like this cancerous growth 
based on proof of I allocate something like work or computational time or then the question like if you go it's like also like um, technological longevity like how long will the product uh, project run like as a project but also like the hardware how long can the hardware last like like um, proof of work uh, requires the latest uh, uh, graphic cards and um, within half a year you need to buy new ones because they're already outdated or not efficient enough and so like they, they basically use to throw them away they build custom computers to kind of mine blockchains and after a year they're useless so you have to, to uh, throw them away and um, that comes also into material inputs that are needed one of the pet projects i'm kind of always interested in is state management it's like what do you need to know and who needs to know what like uh, uh, some blockchains um, most of them have a global state so you need to save it and share it among every computer node uh, uh, globally which is uh, weird which is not very natural that you have like this godlike modus of everyone knows everything and uh, but it's also it's very expensive because you can't store anything you need to be very tight and uh, that leads to something which is gas counting no? like in ethereum you have to count every little interaction you're doing like if you do a calculation this costs gas if you store a piece of data this costs gas and, uh, and this sums up quite quickly and, uh, and part of the reason it's so expensive because storage is very limited and uh, so there's a fight around the storage and um, it's also opening up that everyone can read the data no it's like it's publicly available you can encrypt it but it is still there and there are alternatives um, that's like what I kind of like it's a, it's a holo chain it's implementing that that we have like shared local state most of the data sits with you and you decide where you share the data to with whom and you only have the minimum necessary shared data to validate that it's correct and so like it's it's way more data sparse and uh, also therefore environmentally friendlier because you need much, much smaller computers you need to. So there's a whole I impact on, on believing that you need to, everyone needs to know everything just to generate trust. Um, questions of the ecosystem um, is like if, if you're dealing with technical systems, you are, you're also dealing with uh, ecosystem questions like uh, is the programming language used uh, to people know it, if there is there open source availability, um, are there developers and designers who can work with the things you're working with, uh, is there hosting, um, is there a social acceptance around uh, these things, are they actually used or just like fantasy projects of, um, do they provide the creator tools you need to, uh, um, or want to use, uh, there are legal considerations if you set up something, in different countries you are like different liability things you can send um, or no do you need to found a company or not and all those uh, things and uh, if so is it possible that's like like uh, as Ella already said it's not always that easy to kind of create a blockchain project and then be legally present and allowed like to exist you can exist but you don't exist legally necessarily and um, then also questions on acceptance currency, uh, currencies. If you if you accept hard currencies, fiat like euro or, or dollar, you're always on the winning because there are way more people who can transact in euros or dollars than in cryptocurrencies. So there's an ecosystem you're buying in. As soon as you decide make a currency decision, you're already opening up possibilities or closing them down. Um, fifth is interoperability interoperability um, does the system can it talk to others is it a walled garden or um, can people interface with the project the data the um, uh, is it like like how is it built like is it it's itself a monolithic thing that is responsible or are you already building up on different other projects um, which opens a lot of space if your if your architecture is built around uh, uh, using other services you're already building a different system you're dependent on others but you also not mm, you don't need to build these little parts which allow you to kind of iterate on other things uh, which maybe 
it's not there are some things which are not that interesting to build, like uh, an email server to send a few emails. Like you wouldn't do that yourself. You kind of get the service from somewhere. Um, then if you, if you use value representations and currencies, uh, um, are they used in other places? So if you kind of decide into use Ethereum, for example, you like the, 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 the uh, cryptocurrency you can, and straight away you can, people can use the money they created directly somewhere else. They have to don't, don't have to transfer them or uh, exchange them to something else. Um, which is partly uh, important, for example, also for tax reasons. As soon as you convert a currency if to a, a token to a different token, it's a taxable event. May be important. Um, and then, for example, what is the, with the data of the users? Uh, can they be exported? Do they own them? Do you own them? And uh, that also facilitates interoper interoper uh, interoperability. The next question is decentralization. Do you, who owns the data? Who sits the data? Does the front end um, uh, of the platform have to be used? If it's a contract deployed on a blockchain, people can actually interface with the contracts in different means. So you don't need to use the front end. You could actually like even send like hard-coded messages into the blockchain to kind of transfer with them, which kind of opens up a lot of possibilities. It's like a lot of the ways contracts or, or, or the hacks are happening is because the contracts are available. People can read them and people can uh, use them without bypassing the front end. So like, the, like, like if someone explore, finds a little gap, it's not via the front end and oh, I changed the form field, but like now I kind of go through the back door, which is open. And um, but the question was who can read and write data, um, where sits the data, no? centralized servers, or is it distributed? There are like loads of um, uh, um, also technical and, and efficiency uh, things that are still to be solved. Like for example, file data on IPFS is not the fastest. And uh, if you go to, a, for example, uh, Hiket Nank, which is one of the uh, um, NFT platforms are going to introduce later. It's very slow because it has it's it's serving the raw large files from IPFS, and on your phone it's barely working. And it's, there's no service in between which resizes is to a, a more phone friendly, friendly uh, um, uh, system of a size because uh, they are decided to go the fully decentralized. So they don't want to have like some service in between which is caching the images, processing them and all those things. The next uh, aspect is uh, trust and ac accountability, like how reliable is the system, how long lasting will the system uh, uh, will be, uh, or do you trust that the system is going to be around in five years, uh, um, how accurate is the data, how secure this, what I call proof of humanity is like, can you be sure that participants in the system are actually humans and not bots and maybe not only, not only humans, but also one human, no? like, because like you can also have many wallets as one person. How do you ensure that you're only interacting with one? Like for voting, for example, it's very important that you know you're not like being gamed. They call it uh, civil attacks. No? Where like say people creating several uh, accounts and, and, and uh, manipulating both outcomes by just uh, uh, pretending to be three persons, although they're only one. And then um, where do records and locks sit? Can you access them and all those things? This plays a little bit into the next step. That's uh, the key metrics and measurability. Uh, Peter Drucker, which is like a 50s or 60s uh, management guru. No? Only what gets measured gets managed. And uh, so only what you can see, you can actually manage. So the question is, what do you uh, measure and uh, what can be measured? So it's a technically availability, but also a, a decision to kind of look exactly those three factors. And um, this is interesting because uh, data informs the machine, like all the system, like you can change it based on what you know about it. If you don't know what's working and what's not working, you can't make a decision to change it. 
um, data feeds potential algorithms that are kind of governing the system or helping to govern the system and um, data could also be used for artistic practice just simply like no like it's always nice um, Ella called it value accountancy, which is also interesting, no? and the qu the, an interesting term for that. It's, um, so what's, and the question is what's of value? And it's not necessarily only the price, but it's also the care, for example, or the, uh, um, the reputation in a, in a system, or like, like something which is really difficult to define of what is good art. And how would you represent that? No? So like, like it's, it's quite interesting to be quite clear to discuss what the values is, who creates it, how it's represented, how it's captured and it's extracted. Uh, captured is more if it remains in the system and extracted if you allow it to, to bring it out. Like if you would think like some, some financial inflow and if it would be kind of circling in the system, it's maybe more capturing. But if you allow people to take it out of the thing to buy a house or uh, uh, an apple, uh, uh, it's extracted because it's lost for the system. And um, also like interesting how is it distributed among the members of a, um, a team of the, of the project or community. Um, values have like it's, it's maybe the sentiment uh, is that it, it shouldn't be just that, that men that that, uh, that, that there is a danger that uh, um, if you start measuring something, the system optimizes around the measurements. And uh, that ha happens quite often, like you kind of set a, a certain score and suddenly everyone is passing that score in health system, for example. Like uh, I know, like nursing homes, they all pass with high flying numbers, all of them, this score somehow. So it's becoming useless because everyone learned how to game the system to kind of get the score but like they're actually only optimizing around this score. So like you're setting the, the aim. And uh, that's what Goodhart's law is. No? When a good measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure because people are starting to shape themselves, to align themselves, to work well under this measure. And so it needs to be continuously reviewed. And uh, um, this also plays into the things I already alluded to is uh, uh, that every system will be gamed. Like, um, especially in crypto, like people are making a business on a lifestyle da um, just to look for little loopholes and kind of regardless what project they're doing. Now, like it's, it doesn't matter what, if they see a financial profit out of it, they go for it. And it's, it's just like, like, like a day labor for them. Um, then comes the whole aspect of governance um, to ask uh, you know, who holds power, exercises control, and wields influence. Uh, this is the whole social aspects of uh, um, how does a platform would deal with the task of governance. It's a big thing, and it's, it's more like that, that we need to think about. No? And uh, a few things that could work is uh, uh, forums and discourse chats, voting mechanisms to have a DAO maybe. At the moment, they're more like uh, fund allocation machines, like because like there's a lot of, they're working very well to kind of transfer wallet accounts or maybe vote, but it's, it's to find a consensus and to discuss, like where you actually have to have like human connections, you need to have other, other channels. And uh, one of the mechanisms a lot of projects are doing, they have community tokens, they, people get tokens, and with the tokens they have a, a, a right to vote. Quite often what doesn't work so well is that uh, certain that they're weighted, and so the more you own, the more weight your vote has. And that leads quite often to the fact that two founders have already a winning majority and then they have like a fake charade of uh, participatory, you know, you have no, your little whatever, not point something stake has no influence. It's really hard. Like, so like it's, it's also like how do you do such things is really interesting to look at. And this ties into the other part is like the algorithmic control, like how would you deal with these signals that are too fast, too small, too many for humans to process. No? Like, like you need maybe sometimes support from the machine. And, but like then who's looking at the algorithms that are making those decisions. Um, 
Another aspect is how individual or collective uh, is a platform. And uh, if you think of a normal arts market, it's very, very individualistic. If you're successful, you're successful. And if you want to give something to the community, it's your own donation and your own patronage. So it's not, it's not like enforced in any ways. There's no things like a taxation that kind of distributes a certain part of your income to the community. And um, so you can look at uh, value distributions like taxes, grants, or universal basic income, universal artist income, however you want to call this. You can look at uh, uh, the value enforcements, uh, like regu uh, regulations, like how do you deal with uh, uh, members that are not behaving well, uh, depending on what you think. Um, you can think of affirmative action things where you kind of make a, a decision to bring certain people on board to kind of be more open to certain like support. Um, these are questions of gatekeeping, open, not open, um, who, who's part of this thing or not, how can you become support, and um, if you allow healthy discussions or not on how do you support like conflict resolutions and also like consensus finding like like ideas. The next one is quite it's a it's a it's a it's a sponsy one. What 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 is making sense in the platform? Like if you look at, at lots of those, they have the market logic. It's a marketplace, the price governs everything. Success means uh, you are selling a lot and for a lot. And uh, and if you if you if it, if you're running a system around this, then then, then you're gearing already community to a certain uh, uh, means of of uh, of a certain way of interacting. And um, I it's it's really it's a it's a difficult aspect, and it's like one of the difficult things to to write not to to to. It's it's more like like an idea of what what is making sense in the platform, and that's like the, the prompt. And uh, suggestions are it's maybe not the market, market logic, maybe it is, I don't know. Um, it's, uh, and how do you make sense that the kind of evokings, likes, uh, uh, rankings, or you look at certain uh, measurements, key performance indicators, but it's like an, so the question, what's making sense? One other is the openness, um, which is like, how inclusive is the project and should it be? How accessible, like like literally like in technical accessibility, but also like in uh, how do you understand uh, uh, the, the words you're using? How uh, open, uh, like like is it is it consciously not accessible by being avant-garde or is it as accessible as possible but then not doing disturbing things? Like it's, it's all those questions. Um, technically, it's usability. It's literally, can it be used, and can it be used by as many people as possible, or who do we ex exclude or not? I mean, for AR, it's obviously you have, uh, um, as a blind person, you might be in trouble. No, like uh, um, I don't know how well spoken AR is working, but. Uh, um, there is an interesting thing of concept of the semi-permeability, like are you a closed system but you're consciously open, uh, but only at a reduced level? So like, no, do you have gates but you open and close them, like like cells, they are like, no, they are a system and they have inner processes and then, but they also let things in. Um, is your value proposition a market fit? And the market sounds so bad, but it's like if you are not attracting the right people in the community just because you are trying the wrong thing, you're not open. No? You are kind of like stuck into your own ideas, but you're not listening to what's actually needed. And um, there's the cost of use, like monetary, like can I partake if I don't have money or not? Uh, and also mentally, no? can I, what do I need to learn? How much time do I need to spend with it? How often do I come and visit? It's, it's all those questions. The, I, I didn't mention actually, like, um, that's a bit sad. I have like those three spheres of, uh, uh, of, of influence. This is like um, the individual, the community and society level and the infrastructure level. And all of these slides have a little difference in, in where they actually apply to mostly. 
And I think that's like so one of the other access points of how you could think like will we target more the individual level, the more the community level or more the infrastructure. And utility, for example, is more individual. It's like, it's, it's like my personal utility. Does it work for me? No, like, like if I use it, how much does it cost? Like if I mint an NFT that costs money on Ethereum quite a lot, like uh, is it worth for me to spend a hundred dollar to mint an NFT, but I'm not selling it? Like the, the question like revenue streams, what do I get out of it? And uh, uh, the question is, does people, do people have to promote uh, my work? Do I get support if I have uh, trouble? Do I get maybe feedback on my work, which is quite an interesting thing, no? like, like uh, how do I, or um, does the platform even provide opportunities to me? No? Like uh, do they make open calls for projects? This is like a very nice thing. Some lot of people like to work against such an opportunity motivates. Then the next uh, individual thing is uh, psychological aspects um, where you have uh, intrinsic and extrinsic incentives like do I like to uh, do this because I feel joy out of it or do I like to do it because I get like a external praise uh, um, uh, no, and, uh, like, like does the platform helps that, so it's not only financial incentives, I think, they also help, no? because like as Ella already said, like, like there are lots of projects that are giving you, for each thing you're doing, a, a bit of token. No? If you like on Discord, gets a little credit, and your second like gets another credit, and, and the thinking is that you're not, like you comment, you do a, a GitHub uh, 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 a review or you, you push something like it all gets like up and then it's a financial incentive there around it. Um, it might work, might not work. Um, a lot of platforms are using pl playing with gamification things where you get stars and you can get reach achievements and uh, you you like so it's it's very playful. Um, in these things, um, the perceived utility is linking back to the last one and uh, slide. Um, and then one of the things is like the novelty of the functionality. It can be wow, you know, like if you use something, like uh, if you kind of show the first person the AR uh, view and they, say, and they have never seen it, it's like wow, but it's also alienating for a lot of people. No? And what do you do with this? And you kind of like ne need to bring, if, you, if you're using novel functionality, it, it, it attracts a certain part of uh, society. They find it cool and they, excited but a lot of other people are alienated and they are like skeptical and you need to deal very consciously with these uh, um, two sides of, of novel functionality. Um, the next is uh, a fluidity which uh, it's, it's mainly asking how easy it's to change. Like, like is, is the, the system set up that you can easily change the system or is it difficult, like for whichever reason, technically, mentally, organizationally, like how supportive is the community to change? And uh, um, partly if you, if you think of, of like learning, you need also to kind of like think how quickly can I iterate through different possibilities of learning. And uh, here is um, something that sometimes friction slows down for example, infrastructure questions are very hard qu fr frictions. Like once you, you have your base framework set up, it's very difficult to move somewhere else. But also like it, uh, it doesn't need to be necessarily bad because sometimes friction slowdown is, is leaving time to contemplate, to, uh, it provides stability and um, all those things. And uh, this is like uh, joined with liquidity. Fluidity and liquidity are similar, but not the same. Uh, or velocity, that's more asking w how much action happens in the platform. Like if you think of atoms in, a, in, a, in, a, in water, these are the atoms that are fleeing, flying about and how many, how fast, uh, where they're going. Uh, and um, these are interesting to look at and to kind of maybe measure. It's like it's one of those things, uh, platforms in, in business doing this, the daily active users, the daily monthly users, the transaction value, uh, the number of transactions, and, and all those things which are very inhumane to a certain degree, but also interesting to kind of look at. The two more slides, then aspects are done. Um, 
last uh, one of them is is funding. It's like what are the funding mechanisms for artists on the platform? And I've just listed a few um, for artists. It could be sales, tips or donations, patronage. Um, you could be commissioned by the platform. You could get a universal artist income through the platform for just existing or being listed as a member. And um, then there's the whole topic of financialization. Like if you create artworks, you could allow other people to speculate on future mm -hmm. price rises. No? Instead of sales, you keep the artwork, but you, you create promises on future things. Like uh, financialization is, uh, is, is, is basically betting on future outcomes of certain things. And you can nowadays with distributed finance offer things without let, actually letting go of your artwork. You just, for example, give it for months, you block it, lock it away in a, in a contract. And uh, um, very similar exists for the platform. The platform can obviously seek to extract fees or rent from the platform um, by sales, by having a listing fee, having a creation fee or curation fee or whatever. Uh, you could have tips on donations, you can get patronage, you can seek for external funding, which is uh, maybe an interesting route to go if you're legally set up in a way that you can do it. Um, and then you can also offer more complex financialization. You could, you don't have to, no? but you could, uh, um, uh, all the things you could collect artworks yourself and become a collector and a speculative collector on future growth of the artworks of your artists. Um, you could provide uh, liquidity to 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 art markets. That's like one of those DeFi uh, concepts, uh, and um, you could go full road down the derivatives, uh, um, make bets on future changes in all things and. Uh, some of the new projects are actually thinking about those things. And the last aspect is uh, fundability. It's like, can you be funded as a project? And that's an, an, a question like it's a legal setup uh, and an organizational setup that you're accountable, that you're legally there, that you can apply for grants, that you could uh, 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 receive money, that you can prove that it's going to the right uh, human persons that probably maybe even they're locked to certain classes or non types of, of person. And um, it would maybe be quite good as a platform to be set up that you can actually receive funding. Like there's not, not necessarily state funding, but like uh, there are loads of donors and, 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 and investors that are seeking or would only invest in something which is solid enough that they know it's trustfully invested or funded to. And um, now to the fun part. I oh, know, like there's a list for, for, for all of them, which is just like I brought them together. Uh, you know, there are the 19 I had, like we could probably add a few from Ella's list and maybe 24 or something. And these are the two slides, like the, the, the purple one was where this high impact uh, of these three planes and then the middle end impact. And a little recap no, before I show you the examples. Like, um, so platforms are there to provide organizational and functional primitives that can facilitate the creation, curation, uh, and exhibition capture of value and commissioning of artworks. And now if you think of those examples I'm going to show, it's like what do they do around those things? Like. Um, The first example is, is a simple a digital marketplace which is not blockchain based. Uh, Itch.io is a, is, is a games marketplace. You can buy uh, indie games there no? and they're promoted and it's a bit like an Amazon for indie games. And they have a few likes and they have uh, ranking boards and they use a bit uh, um, uh, of a gamification like leaderboards and all those things so you get uh, as a, as a creator, you get like, oh, God, I'm part of the game, or no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing better or not, and, and also to help the users to find good games. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, maybe more structured, like it's, it's, a, it's, 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 as a platform, it's centralized on a closed source. It owns, it's owned by someone. They're open to the community by feedback, but they're not like a community-owned product. The, um, 
they make sense in the market logic, which sells well as majority you know, things is, is the good thing. Um, and they're running something like the superstar economy, no? like the ones that are doing well are on the top of the listing. And uh, if you go through, you always see quite a, quite a, if you go through listings and people are showing actually sales or so, you can see the, the, the steep fall. Like you have like, um, with, with other NFT markets are gonna show, like you could check and you could see that the first ones are selling millions and the 30th are already in the 10 thousands. And then comes a long, long, long tail of 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100. Um, the, the governance system here is a private enterprise. Um, they are making a fee cut. Uh, that's how it's financed. Uh, it's a classic um, Web2 website. Uh, and uh, you, you need a credit card to partake, no? because you need to buy the things. The next project um, I've, I've chosen to show rarible.com, but like it's, 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 there's a whole class of these trendy NFT marketplaces. Like uh, if you heard of people or uh, Edward Snowden or whoever sold this one is sold on one of them, most likely. If it's not sell, uh, auctioned off by Sotheby's or uh, Christie's. No? Like, like, um, and they are, um, usually running by now on the Ethereum mainnet. That means proof of work and, and a high environmental cost. Um, they run the global state, which is my pet hate, uh, but uh, forget about it. Um, and they are like closed source -ish. So the front end is closed source. The contracts are publicly available, but like most of the people interact with it via the front end. So you're required to use the website and um, and then log in with your wallet. The uh, value and sense making is again scarcity based and the market logic and it's an absolute superstar economy, absolute, absolute. Um, and they are not even really so far, none of them I've seen is like trying to push different views. It's all like you go there and you see the top. Or maybe if you do, you see the recent the latest uh, mintings no, and submissions, but this is also very difficult. You need sometimes something which is bringing up no, different views, different voices, or whatever you want to call it. Um, most of them are a private enterprise, um, and some of them have already a community token, and all of them are going something along what, which is called the progressive decentralization. Um, I have links, uh, there's like a, a, a Silicon Valley uh, um, uh, venture capital firm, eight, uh, A16Z, they have like a big, long, nice and interesting post around what does it mean to be progressively decentralizing. It means first you start as a closed thing and then you open up to the stakeholders and you, you try to give up voting rights more and more in, while you're building up a community strong enough. But most of the time, people keep a, a good, good, very good chunk of, their, of, of the, the, the community tokens to the founders of the project. So they always have an imbalance in, in power or at least financial gains in the very end, even though it's a community-based project. Yes. I mean, can you quantify, can you quantify it as a form of community worsening? So I think the idea that there is a community behind it, but at the end of the day, like, or is there a, a material, you know, advantage in doing this? Yeah, like, like, like a lot of those projects actually have um, financial gains. No, like okay. if you get community co tokens, you might get a, a very sizable chunk of value. Uh, okay. uh, but the question is still like, 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 are you just getting a little bit of the pie? You know, yeah, uh, yeah. It's how big is your slice? No, and uh, and it's also uh, around um, uh, voting rights mm -hmm. because quite often they are also linked. So like, like, even though people might give up eighty percent of the tokens mm -hmm. to the stakeholders. Yeah. But then if the stakeholders are again acting in a superstar economy and it's based yeah. on, on financial success in the platform, yeah. you have 15 people who are doing, having the vast majority of voting rights. Yeah. So yeah, but my, but my point was, is this a strategy, a branding strategy? Of course, it's like greenwashing, it's, it's community washing yeah. to a certain degree. Yeah. 
because like it's it's always like and then there's always the question is like who's have wielding the influence uh, if you have the founder who is a very opinionated and is like even you have a forum and and the founding person can shut off a communication a, a discussion by saying well well i don't think it's a good idea and yeah. discussion is ended it's 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 just like like there is soft power that's not hard mm -hmm. It's just softly exercised power by um, the people with more influence. Okay. Um, coming back to the NFT, this they basically here, this is like the generic NFT platform. And um, there are plenty of them, like loads. And what maybe the, m the interesting things to look at is liquidity. Like, like, like if I buy or sell something, am I sure that I can resell it? Uh, and uh, not necessarily at a profit, but like that even it's enough interest in the platform that I know that there is something going on. And um, if, you, if you look at Ethereum-based platforms, they are quite often high. Um, because it's Ethereum, it's a massive, uh, uh, one of the biggest blockchains around, and uh, there's a lot of investors interested in doing such things. And uh, a lot of these platforms interface with secondary markets like OpenSea. Um, that means you buy an NFT on this platform, but you can sell it somewhere else. So you're not locked into the one market, but you can go to uh, and have a second place where you can sell the NFTs to a wider audience than just the users of this platform, which is a very um, interesting thing. One of the things is, uh, is royalties and uh, artist uh, resale uh, rights. Uh, and uh, if secondary markets are enforcing these, uh, like uh, um, some of those platforms actually have it. And some of the uh, secondary markets uh, actually also enforcing royalties. That means a cut, a fixed cut of the sales price of the ongoing sales, let's say 10%. Oops. There needs to be something. Ah. And one of the psychological things which of these NFT platforms had uh, have uh, is the theatrics of the auction. It's it's nearly entertaining to watch how someone is auctioning off like the Edward Snowden thing. It's like big numbers and then the drama of just passing and then they have something where the auction gets extended with the next, uh, 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 if, if someone um, makes an offer, it's then you have another 30 seconds or in extending the slot. So, so like you're never sure when it ends and, and so it goes up and then it's on a million and then a million five and it goes on and you never know, no, now it's finished, no, it's extended. And so like there's a whole drama around the auction. And people seem to love auctions in, in the NFC space. So like uh, a lot of projects are coming up with the auction thing because it seems to be the way of selling NFTs. Um, the openness question, it's a Web3 distributed app. You need a wallet. It sort of works on a phone, but it works on computers better. It, uh, uh, you have to have a wallet. You need to get your head around. You need to find uh, a way to get cryptocurrency into the system. Um, some of those platforms are allowing other ways. Uh, uh, like there are also other ways of getting your wallet. Um, but like it's there like quite a lot of frictions still around the uh, crypto or Web3 space. And uh, funding is fee cuts, definitely. It's very clear about this. Or some of them also have community tokens, so you have a second revenue stream as founders by creating more value for those tokens and sell them later. <coughs> you have alternative NFT markets, which are running either on private Ethereum chains or other blockchains. There are really a load, loads of them around. Um, some of them are more like Web 2.0 marketplaces, but with NFTs, because like if, if you basically, at some point, a, a, a blockchain just becomes a database. And if you are closing it up and you make your own private database uh, blockchain, then it's nothing else than a database. No? You can claim that you have NFTs, but it is not the big difference to uh, uh, running it in a normal database and saying, trust me, this thing is unique, and it's, uh, no, it can only be sold once. Um, Hmm? Say that again, sorry. 
Well, it is, it is, but like they claim, yeah, but basically if, you, if they're running a private, I can set up today a private blockchain and I can issue an NFT on that blockchain and you have to trust me that I tell you it is because it's not the main net, it, is, it just sits on my computer and we have to have an agreement that I won't be cloning the data or deleting this NFT and uh, no, 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 I mean, uh, trust me. Uh, but but it, it's, it, it could also implement it in a normal relational database. And I tell you, you know, I, I guarantee you that record number one is your NFT. I won't touch it. And, um, but the advantages of, of, of private chains on non-Ethereum is the environmental impact. You have, uh, uh, you know, like you can run other systems, you can run environmentally friendly blockchains, you can run faster transactions, uh, more transactions per second. Um, you can do something like the XDAI sidechain, which is like a, an Ethereum compatible chain running on XDAI, on DAI, um, which is like a proof of authority. So like it's, it's way more uh, uh, environmental friendly and it's, it's actually like you can deploy the same things you would do on Ethereum, but running it on a, on a, on a, on a side chain that is uh, using a stable coin, so it's no fluctuation, but nearly. So it's nearly worth a dollar, which is quite nice because you know one die is one dollar and uh, you know what you get out of it in the end. And uh, it's, it's faster, environmentally friendlier. So there are advantages to, to not be on the mainnet. Um, but you, you lose, I think the main uh, highlight is, uh, uh, or downside is the trust and account accountability issues. No, like you, you are, need to trust the sidechain. You need to trust more than, you, you always need to trust the technical system, but you need to uh, trust more the um, sidechain projects. And some of those projects even don't give you the private key to the wallets they're holding for you. That means you're not really owning it. So you're owning, you know, like that's what I mean with the, uh, um, uh, it, it could be a simple database, uh, just putting it on a blockchain. There we come to the first different, slightly the beginning of the different project, which is running on a different non-Ethereum blockchain, Bitstamp. And um, to my knowledge, uh, they are they are hosting the wallets, no? Like so, like you don't have access to the private uh, uh, keys. So, I don't know how you get all these NFTs you bought there, these artworks onto your own wallet. I haven't bought anything. Maybe there's a button there which says transfer to a different Bitstamp wallet. Could be, but they are basically making it very easy. That's the advantage. All you need is a, your email address, and they send you a link, and you're in, and a wallet is created for you, and uh, you can pay with your credit card via Stripe. It's all super nice. So, like the buying, I think it's 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 a low friction way of onboarding new users to buy digital art. This is one of the advantages. No? The downside is the, that you lose control as a user. You have to trust the platform that they are hosting them. Properly. Yeah, yeah, and but they also have other advantages. I think Feral Files is nice because they're actually host, hosting real digital art. Yeah. It's not just videos and, uh, uh, and and gifs and and images, but like you can actually code. And, and this is one of the things that's related to art. Right? Yes. Right? Yeah. So it is, and and it's 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 absolutely only curated. It's exhibitions curated by humans who select artists and. Uh, so you don't have like this stream of endless stream of, of, of NFTs, but you are having a, a, a very selected few artworks, which are more, like I think the presentation is nice. It, it really works well as, as, as to present the artworks in as best as you can probably right now. Um, and um, it could host AR works, because it's like how they're technically hosting, like they could, if they can host processing uh, or uh, uh, shader uh, uh, coding, then they can also host uh, the files needed to, to show AR work. Um, f uh, liquidity is probably very low because no one is using uh, uh, Bitstamp and it's only very few artworks that, that are sold. So like it's, it's more um, probably more of a collector supporting an artist patronage style than actually hoping of speculative gains in the future. 
I think, because like, like you have no security that in five years you can still sell this artwork. Also, you don't know if it's gonna run on a computer, which is a different you know, uh, uh, issue, with, uh, especially if you use dynamic digital art. Um, the next example is uh, Heket Nank, or HEN. Um, it runs on Tezos, alternative blockchain, cleaner than Ethereum. Um, it is a marketplace predominantly, uh, predominantly, but also on this comes now on the shift, like you can see, like the next examples are gonna be a, a bit more in this direction, it's more of a protocol. So like there, there's a layer between the blockchain and the marketplace, which is the protocol layer, which allows to, which actually facilitates the creation of NFTs, the sale of NFTs, and, um, and, and you can go and create a project which is more protocol level, so you're enabling other projects to do things instead of you as a project that does a thing. So as a platform thinking, you can also think of uh, a task is not only to, to create your own little arts market or arts project, but you could also create an opportunity for other arts projects to create. And um, quite often they go hand in hand. Um, like all the other NFT market spaces have to a certain degree create the same code, but they are not making them publicly available. The aim is not to reuse this part of the code. Their aim is to be the shop front and to be as efficient and as slick and as usable as possible. But like, uh, it's not uh, to kind of say, hey, these are the basic raw contracts uh, or SDKs, this is the way you can use them. And um, Heket Nank is starting to open up the plat protocol level. So like there are like lots, of, and they have now these the classically usable, I find it awful. Like, like you, you scroll and it's an endless scroll of NFTs and some are trashy and some are great and very few are really great. And, and uh, you can buy somehow and some people are selling artworks uh, there and some big, bigger, bigger names are there. But I, I, I like the project. No? It's, it's, it has a bit of the alternative vibe. It came out of nowhere out of an artistic need, and it's not like a, a Silicon Valley startup funded with uh, venture capital. Uh, um, so the, the air is different. It's a, it's a good one to kind of like look at and... Um, For example, like like a functional primitive is an auction would be a, a, a module which allows you to auction off an NFT is a functional primitive, or uh, the creation of an NFT is a, a functional primitive. But also user login uh, to list your NFTs or your artworks. Um, uh, like there's lots of these little things that kind of combined become a. Uh, um, but you can see like in the next project that's getting more and more down the uh, uh, protocol level. And um, for example, oh, Dada Art we already had. I like it because it's like uh, the co-creation of work and that it's kind of like looking at it as, um, it's, it, it feels more like a community spirit. And uh, the creators of the project are quite loud, which is positively meant they, they talk a lot about the project, they reflect a lot on it, they write a lot about it. So it's, it's a really interesting thing because it is, it's, it's, it's not first of all a marketplace for NFTs. It, is, it happened to do NFTs earlier than a lot of the other NFTs and they came with a different spirit on it, which was this let's scribble together on the internet, uh, uh, literally was the beginning, let's make drawings and make them permanent. And um, I, I, like, I like the project and I think there's a lot to learn of uh, reading what they also wrote about it. Like I, I, I personally don't know as much, like, like I had the feeling they kind of burst it up last year and didn't do much actually in the next year. So like I couldn't find anything what happened after they said that's our plan. Yeah, but like what happens from this was last year and it's now literally last May. And yeah. what happened the last 12 months? Corona, uh, probably, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I d but I couldn't, you know, like, like my quick yeah. way was like, I couldn't find a new interface that allows to do other oh, things. Okay. Uh, no, like, like literally, uh, yeah. 
I, 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 wrote, I read a few of the articles and I said like they're, they're shying away from uh, experience points and the full gamification thing. And if you look at the platform now, they have it. Yeah. They're showing the likes, they're showing the points, they're showing the achievements. And so like they went apparently full gamification. Uh, uh, in, but uh, um, like, like it's not a critique, it's more interesting like, like what happens to such projects. The next one is our Zora, which is a, uh, which is a marketplace, but it's actually um, predominantly a protocol. They're trying to implement the things you need to do to run your own marketplace. They create something which they call crypto media, which you can then mint, and then they have like the way of, of, uh, of selling it and the, the way of imp imp implementing and enforcing uh, royalties. And, and, uh, and, and so on, they, they provide, um, Therefore, I gave you two links. Uh, one is the, uh, uh, the Zora.co, which looks more like an NFT marketplace. And then the Zora.engineering, which is the documentation for coders. Uh, and um, you can see they are kind of like rolling out more and more functionality. The, new, the newest thing they did is like an, an auction house out of the box. You can basically, it's a, it's a GitHub repo. You can instantiate it. You change your visuals and you have an auction house running. So you can mint NFTs and you can auction them off. And it's, it's, it's independent of and the advantage for them, you're using their protocol. It's Ethereum based, which is uh, the biggest con, uh, the, the, like it's environmental, but it's also financially. It's really, really expensive to mint an NFT. Maybe not yet at the moment because NFT, is, but uh, uh, it, it was $200. And so you need to be sure what you're doing. And you're creating, then you're always a mint, you're, you're creating a value you're not sure you're ever gonna get back for something which is maybe useful or maybe not. No? Like, uh, um, but our, our Zora is one of those projects which is, like, which I find, yeah, I can only say it's a protocol project. No? Like it's, it's, it's becoming more like enabling others to do things than uh, we are the end point of doing things. There's a different example in going in a similar direction, which is like they haven't built anything yet. They only do the talking about it. Uh, uh, it's a JPEG. It's a collectors and curators protocol. The idea is that you can get as a collector of NFTs, you join up team with uh, curators and uh, you, you exhibit your NFTs and then you can maybe sell them there or you uh, not like, and I think the main purpose of these is first uh, is creating, uh, it's finding the pearls, like no, out of this endless sea of NFTs which are valuable, but it's also creation of value. If you find some curator which is like, uh, is gaining a lot of attention, uh, whatever he or she is, uh, uh, um, it's selecting is auto automatically gaining value. No, it's not a question of quality, but it's more like uh, that person has decided to, to make that uh, 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 choice. And they're running at fully protocol level. They're going to have a front end that allows you to display the um, exhibitions. But the main thing is that you can bring these onto the blockchain. And the last is the sphere is like they had a heavy, heavy zip of academic uh, uh, reading. And, uh, and but look, it's, it's like, so like they're really infused with, with uh, Deleuze and Guattari and Brian Masumi and, uh, and uh, you can feel it, no? Like, like uh, but they are doing something which I find really interesting because they are, they got, they use their, their writing skills to get a, Pick a sizable grant from the EU uh, to kind of experiment uh, uh, on, on how to bring a platform thinking, like literally in the organizational and functional parts uh, and performing arts, circus uh, and uh, performers uh, together into one room to kind of think and practice and try out how you could run a digital based platform that supports ongoing uh, creation of performance arts. And 
depending on how you enter this, uh, at the moment it's still a bit scarce, I think, for me at least, uh, uh, from the outside of what they're doing. So a few videos and a few conferences uh, you can uh, watch back and uh, a bit of writing. Um, but I think what they're what they're coming from, they were also working with Furtherfield and Ruth Cutlow, who was like one of the first quotes, uh, uh, culture before structure, um, is, is part of that. Uh, they, they try to, to create a project. So they're, they're like doing something similar on a bigger scale, I think, than what we want to do. And um, they're gonna do things like in a DAO or quad, quad, quadratic voting like, and. Um, Maybe mint NFTs, I think they're gonna do it, but like maybe not in a form of as an individual artwork, but I think what I understood, it's more like a, a trace of a performance that you can buy maybe. So it's not like to, because performances are ephemeral uh, and, um, and they are viewed maybe in, to, to be seen in the moment. And um, that's also an interesting project to follow. And uh, lastly, if I think of an open AR platform, it's we should think about what the value in the system is and uh, is it is it just the price and what is the value we capture um, i think it should probably be mobile first which is kind of limiting maybe a technical choice because like the ar pieces live natively on the phone and uh, um, so and then it probably shouldn't be a native app because sales in a native app that went through the app store you need to give a cut to apple and google it's always a discussion if it's worse that you have more potential users that are offsetting the 30 percent loss or not and also you really want to give google 30 percent of your artwork i don't know um, then i hope it could be something that uh, uh, covers the creation curation, capture, and commissioning of artwork. Um, how it could be something that it's maybe alleviating, not stopping, because I think superstar economy also has its advantages, but like to be very conscious about like bringing other voices, other contributions to the forefront and dampening the effects of the superstar economy. Um, and then maybe it could be set up in a way that governmental funders can trustfully. The sphere, by the way, is trying to do the exactly the same. They want to set up a machine, uh, as I call it, an abstract machine that allows funders to pour money and top in. And the artist and the community decides how it's distributed and uh, allocated fairly. And I think that's one of the most interesting things about this. No? Like, uh, and you need to have a certain setup and a size and all those things to be able to do that. And feedbacks, questions, if you want to talk about that, uh, hi at vincentvanderslin.com. And I have links, like I think I'm going to share the slides, so there are a few nice reads. There are plenty more, but like, um, I don't know how we are in time. <laughs> was a lot. Huh? <laughs> well, I think I can make you to two conclusions. Uh, great, and then uh, have you spread out the rules and then uh, anything goes. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh. Good, good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you.